Don't you just love it? And by love it, I actually mean hate it. When you work really hard to make a really good how-to tutorial video, teaching someone everything you know about something, and it only gets a few views. But the kicker is there's some other person on YouTube who just had like, did it on their cell phone, shaky hand cam, and just like one take and it looks like they put no thought into it whatsoever, and they are consistently all day long outranking your beautifully crafted how-to video. Why is that, and what can you do with your how-to content going forward to get more views, more subscribers, and grow the business around your channel that you are growing? All of that and way more coming up in this episode. Hey, welcome to the Video Creators Podcast presented by vidIQ. You know how you put a lot of time and energy into your YouTube channel for not nearly enough growth? Yep, we get it. We are here today to help you change that. Hello creators, how are you guys? It's great to see you again for another Video Creators Podcast episode like we do here every week just to help you grow your YouTube audience, grow your channel, grow the business that you are growing around your channel so you can continue to reach more people and change their lives with the message that you are spreading. And we are very excited to do that with you here today. I'm hanging out with Sam and Ingrid, two of the YouTube strategists here in our team at Video Creators. Hello, Sam, how are you doing this, this week? Howdy. I'm doing pretty good. Good. How about you? Is Ingrid? I'm I'm doing great. I'm about to go on vacation. So I was gonna I'm say you're going to Jamaica, right? <laughs> That's right. Sandy Usually leading up to vacation is like not doing great. It's like stress, stress, no. stress, stress, yeah. so I can take a vacation. Yes. Yes, I would agree with that. My week has kind of been a little bit like that, but that's okay because I see the light at the end <laughs> of the tunnel. Almost there. And the light isn't an oncoming train, right? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Every week, we like to introduce you to a creator in the video creators community who's doing something awesome that we can learn from. Ingrid, you've been working with a lady named Annie on her channel. Tell us a little bit about what she's been able to accomplish. Yeah, it's funny because she first spoke to you, Tim, I want to say like 14 months ago. And when she first came to you uh, in a consultation, uh, she had grown her keto cooking channel to over 200,000 subscribers. But her growth was starting to decline, <laughs> which is the story. As a result of talking often. to me or when she talked to me? <laughs> <laughs> not as a result of talking to you. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but you, you did not hold back in the consultation at all. Oh, really? <laughs> she's did you watch the to, recording? She, yes, she's about to tell us. Uh, <laughs> I did watch the recording. No. I did watch the recording. But as a result uh, of you really giving her the unfiltered version of Ouch. what's kind of holding her back a little bit, um, she decided to work more closely with us. And that is where she decided to work with me one-on-one -on -one in the action plan. And we continued to work on a long-term basis, which was really kind of cool because she learned how to effectively tell storytelling in her how-to content to massive results. And mm. I think everybody's going to really enjoy the story. When you first came and you talked to Tim in a consultation, where were you at in your creator journey? Give us a little bit about your story. Yeah, I, at that point, I think I had, um, it was over 200,000 subscribers and I had one video, I mean, I had a, a couple that had done really well, but there was just one video that really took off and went viral and brought in a ton of subscribers for me and a ton of views and it was starting to die off. And it, I mean, it went for a long time. It brought in so many subscribers and um, dollars and views for almost a year, but it was starting to kind of die off as more and more people saw it and it wasn't doing as good. And I didn't know how to replicate that. So I reached out to Tim and had a one-on-one -on -one consultation with him. And it was really interesting. Like he, he took like a deep dive into all my videos and watched them. And he was like, he told me that my videos were boring. Like he's like, you have no personality in there. And that kind of shocked me because I was just like, oh, I like, I didn't realize that <laughs> there was like, there was none of me like showing through. And he also said he wanted to know my story of like, why, 
why I was keto and why I was doing this. So I explained to him, like, you know, we've been doing this for almost 10 years and started off as weight loss, weight loss, but then it turned into something more. Like I started to feel really good. I started to think better, had more energy. I just, I felt really good eating keto. It wasn't really about weight loss anymore. And he's like, you, none of that is showing through in any of your videos. And he's like, you really need to dive into that if you want to, reach a broader audience and get more people to relate to you and watch you. So that was, that was huge. I remember it's funny. Cause I don't think you've ever told me that Tim told you that your content was boring. I, that was his exact <laughs> So that's like, that's what I took. From it. It was like, <laughs> no but I do. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I do remember in the beginning, that was such a huge focus and it was true because you are the quintessential how to channel right? Mm -hmm. You teach people how to literally take food that is would normally be considered high carb, like a stack of pancakes, and turn it into something that is not just low carb, but delicious and tasty to make them feel like they can actually continue on their journey, right? In the keto, living a keto lifestyle. And that's an amazing thing. But when you're just looking at a recipe as a how-to channel, that's just information, right? Yeah, exactly. It was like I was designing my videos more for search content. And because I'm thinking people just want the recipe. So let's just give them the recipe. And they don't really care much about what I have to say. But in fact, with YouTube, it's the opposite. Like they, people actually want to see your personality. So what are the things that you did to kind of change that? Um, I started to, um, for one, I actually started to script out my videos. And me sitting down and kind of writing it in my own language of of how I would say it, I was able to kind of like interject some of my personality and my humor into it, which people really loved and could relate to. Cause I mean, I feel like I'm a funny person, but it was like, never, (laughs) never showed in any of my videos before. Like I have sarcasm and, and just things like that, that people, people find funny. So I started to insert that a little bit more. And then one of the things that Tim and you too, Ingrid talked about was like a lot of those like primal branding elements that we would put in to just to, um, you know, people make me want to come back for more and um, say like, oh, that keto focus always has her videos like this, or she always says that Um, little phrases, things like that. Microwave is the devil. (laughs) So people always expect that from me. How was the transition for you? Did you find it awkward? I mean, how does it, how did it make you feel as you were stepping into more of your own voice in your content? I, I mean, yeah, it was awkward. It's, it's a, it's a, str- I mean, it still is a struggle. I feel like I, there's um, some video, I mean, obviously my videos have been doing better since I started working with you guys, but there's still some videos that just don't hit it. And people, you know, I must've said something wrong or they don't do as well as I think that they should. So it's definitely a learning process. And I feel like I've gotten better over this last year with working with you guys. And there's still some things that I need to work on. And it's just like this constant, it's almost like a constant reminder that I have to, to have. And it's, you know, just the longer I'm with you guys, the more it's nailing it down of like, oh, it needs to be, I need to say things like this, or it really should be structured this way. When I first started working with you, I didn't really ever look into my demographics. I mean, I knew it was mostly women, but I I thought that they were mostly my age, um, younger, like young mothers, and which I do have a lot of that, but actually I have a lot of older women, like in their 50s and 60s. And so a lot of them, they're maybe empty nesters. And I really dived into their struggle because as I started showing more of my personality and some of my struggles and issues with the keto diet, especially with finding that it like... I always was afraid to tell people that, you know, you you don't have to be 100% clean keto all the time because I thought people would just say, oh, I'm not going to watch you. Like, how dare you tell people that they could eat, um, have a, tr- a treat meal or a cheat meal every once in a while. Um, and I was always afraid to dive into that. But once I started to, I realized that a lot of people related to that and that struggle because that's what they go through regularly. And it's not, keto isn't just about, losing weight and being thin and healthy all the time. I mean, healthy, yes, but it's about other things too. People are on it for different reasons. How did all those results that you have experienced on on the channel and in your business make you feel? 
Oh, really good. I'm, yeah, I'm super excited to see just, it's like all the numbers are growing or doubling in some cases. And it's, it's been great. It was really the thing that I needed to bring life back into my channel. So if you had one thing that you could, one piece of advice that you could give our audience, you know, on staying with it as a creator, or maybe even potentially coming and working with us, what would that thing be? I think the biggest change for me that I did as a creator was really showing myself a little bit more, like more of my personality and building that community. And once I saw what my audience wanted and started to provide more of that, then it just seems like it kind of snowballed and, and, um, I, I like I love that all the engagement that, and all the comments that I get from people now because I used to not really get too many, but now I get a lot more. And all of that was because of video creators, because of them encouraging me to try different things and and um, do these techniques and strategies. It's been really, really helpful. And to have a sounding board too with going to you and asking about thumbnail ideas, ideas or titles, um, video ideas is, is really great to have a partner. I love that Annie got good results. I'm... <laughs> I want to go back and watch that recording now. See <laughs> how how heavy hand. I'm not usually heavy handed, but um, I guess it could come across that way. Interesting. Um, well, I'm also you conscious about, it, about this. Your one. content is like your baby, and if anybody's telling you anything other than it's perfect, <laughs> I know your uh, your baby's ugly. Well, I'm glad it worked out well. <laughs> I, I know some people love uh, unfiltered advice. Usually I'm like, these things are going well. Here's some things to consider as opposed to my goodness, face palm. This is like, whew. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but anyway, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad it worked out well for her and uh, that she's having success today. If you are interested in talking with us about what an engagement with you could look like and how we can help you reach your goals on YouTube and grow your business and grow your channel, we'd love to talk with you. You can go to video creators.com slash discovery call and book a 15 minute session or you'll talk with one of us on the team. I think Blake is doing many of them right now. So you will likely get Blake. He's awesome. You'll love talking with him. Uh, ask him to change the color in his background to whatever color you want for your meeting. <laughs> he doesn't know I said that. So we'll be a little surprised, but just roll with it because it's something we do in our team meetings with him every week. <laughs> so um, do that. It'll be fun. But go to videocreators.com slash discovery call, schedule your 15 minute session. And we just want to hear your story, hear where you're at with your channel, what your goals are, and then just let you know, like, here's how we can help you. This is what it could look like. And then you can choose from there if it's what you need or not. And now we just want the opportunity to, to just kind of hang out a little bit and see how we can help. So videocreators.com slash discovery call. Well, I think we have a thing or two to say about how to content, right? Um, Definitely. I think in my own YouTube journey, it started off primarily uh, with how to content, but it was more like tips and ideas around around youth ministry at the time and helping youth workers with their groups and their teenagers and working with them. So it's still very informational, uh, information driven. Uh, and then it, we started focusing more on our family's vlogging channel was my, as our family was growing with our uh, one kid and two kids and three kids and uh, now seven, but we haven't been vlogging for all of them. But back when family vlog, vlogging was pretty popular, um, we did that. And then video creators started growing and I shifted back to more how-to type of content. Here's how you do this thing on YouTube. Here's how you add annotations, which aren't a thing anymore, but that's like, you know, stuff like that. And and then we've been transitioning into storytelling and then mixing storytelling and how-to content together. So I think... Um, we've seen it all here. Uh, I haven't done any music videos yet, so maybe I haven't. I haven't done all of it. Yet. I don't think anyone wants yeah. me to do a music video. <laughs> but, Sam might have you covered there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, we'll Sam does. Yeah, you're just okay. gonna tell me it's boring though. So, <laughs> Sam, your content is boring. <laughs> boring. I think not really. No, I like your content, especially the shorts that pop up. I'm like, oh hey, I know that guy. All right, but there you go. Um, Ingrid, when we start thinking about how do we make how-to content that performs, because there's a lot of it out mm -hmm. there, right? Um, how, what do we, where do we start with, with evaluating competition or just like, yeah, where do we go? Well, I think that one of the things, we work with a lot of how-to channels too. Um, 
one of the questions that I always find myself asking is what makes this different from somebody else, right? When you think of all your competition, what sets you apart? Um, you know, Tim, you like to talk a lot about blue ocean and red ocean theory, right, in business. I think it also kind of applies to to content and your competition. Yeah, for people who don't know blue ocean, red ocean, it's like – Red Ocean is where all the sharks are swimming. There's a lot of blood in the water because everyone's competing. Blue Ocean is where there's no blood in the water because you're the only shark, <laughs> you yep. know, in the in that water, I suppose. And I think yeah. of like a lot of people who probably started on YouTube a ways back. That very well might have been true, mm-hmm. right? They were there's the still only blue oceans way. on YouTube, but but it, the blue ocean comes more like oh it's never been presented this way before as mm-hmm. opposed to no one's ever presented that before that thing yeah yeah and i also tell a lot of creators too cuz i find especially when they're a little on the newer side of their journey maybe haven't been on the platform for 10 years um they have a tendency to say well my this worked for my competitor so I'm going to do that. So that doesn't really work. Um, only you can really do you. <laughs> you know, uh, your competition, they have their thing that they do really well. You've got to find that thing that really sets you apart and find the voice um, that you have around your topic. Yeah. Sam, there's a lot of creators who do how-to content. And it seems like it's pretty typical that they'll get one video or two maybe and like oh wow that one got a lot of hits you know like the one about maybe how i fixed my how to fix a lawnmower right or or something that one's got millions but the rest of them only have a couple hundred views when you have a few hits but the growth isn't consistent maybe where where are some places to start man that's such a good question i feel like there's so many thank you you could go (laughs) (laughs) There's so many directions you could go. I, I feel like, uh, well, honestly, the first question that pops into my head, if I if I see that, is usually traffic sources. Like, where is the traffic usually coming from? You know, if you have one video that completely blows up and it's just kind of this roller coaster ride of, you know, it's you have no I no bearing on is this one going to get a gajillion views or is it going to just be dead in the water? Um, usually I'm curious to see, you know, are most people searching for this thing and then they watch it and then they never come back because they just got what they came for and there was no reason for them to stick around or are they seeing this on the homepage and they may kind of more voluntarily click on it due to some intrigue or something like that. I think that's where titles and thumbnails really come into play. Those can be really important to create that level of intrigue to get somebody to click in kind of with this expectation of like, oh, this was interesting versus I got a quick problem. I got to fix it. And then I get what I came for and then I leave right away sort of a thing. Yeah. If you're getting a lot of traffic from search, that's good. That's fine. But typically your average view duration is going to be shorter than if it came from homepage or suggested. And so if you're trying to get the most amount of watch time to grow the video, uh, search might not be the best traffic source. Now, a lot of how-to content can be found in in search, but you're also, to your point, um, in great, there's a lot of competition. It's like the first 10 results or something maybe, right? Um, as opposed to making a, a how-to video that's more discoverable and suggested or on the homepage or some sort of recommendations feature on YouTube, then you could potentially not only get better average view durations per viewer, but get surface to people who aren't even searching for your content, right? Yeah. And uh, people who watch one how-to video and want to learn about this thing, and then maybe you're not the first video they watch, but you might be video two, three, four, or five in that, in that session. And by that time, they are giving you a lot more uh, watch time uh, than the person who just quickly clicked on the first one and skipped ahead and then abandoned it. So um, yeah, I I think if you're getting a lot of traffic from search, uh, that's that's to be expected on how-to content. But I do think that most people making how-to content focus on search and thus it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as opposed to making how-to content that could be surfaced elsewhere through other discovery mechanisms on YouTube. What do you think, Inger? What else would you poke at um, to try to help that content? Just to kind of piggyback on that also is I find that when you're crafting for search, you're crafting your video differently also. Right. Right. Very sterile usually. 
very like, much like what, we talked what about. Some Annie, people might Annie call Annie boring, earlier. but not me. Right? <laughs> some we people. About and, don't get, and don't get me wrong because her content is amazing. She's very skillful at what she does, but it removed so much of the personality I know, from yeah. it. And that was yep. the problem. Yep. Right? So I feel like, you know, search has value and search definitely has value too, especially if you're a, a smaller channel that maybe doesn't have as many data points and you can maybe get into that search feed to where you have some recent content that might get clicked in and start getting some data points, but it's only going to get you so far. That's such a good point. Like the personality, you know, points, the the connection points that, that stick out as a viewer. Like I just was thinking, I don't know about you guys, but I was just thinking about the people I'm subscribed to or the people that I tend to watch over and over again. And a lot of them are actually how to channels. Um, but those people in particular, I keep watching them because I feel like I've connected to them on some personal level. Like it wasn't just about the right. information. The thing that kept got me to keep coming back was uh, those personal touch points. Um, and that even makes me think, you know, if, if you are, if you have a how to channel and you've noticed that you have some of these videos that are performing super, super well, you could even look into your data and maybe you're noticing some patterns in those particular videos. You might even notice if you look in your retention graphs or anything like that, you know, maybe the videos that are performing super well, maybe you have some personal touch points in there. Maybe you shared some of your primal branding or some creation story, you know, some bits about yourself and they're performing because of that. So just to piggyback on that, I think another way that you can kind of pinpoint kind of what's happening here, if you have some high performers is you may have even unintentionally created some of those connection points. Right. And I feel like a lot of how to channels too, um, they get nervous, the creators when you start to recommend that they work in personal, some personal connections, because it's all about the, you know, the recipe or, you know, the art or the YouTube strategy. What does my story have to do with it yeah. <laughs> at all? Well, that's yeah. exactly right? the story I was kind of alluding to in the beginning <clears throat> that I didn't go fully into, but, or actually at all into <laughs> the, uh, the I, I actually did a session this is several years ago now with a channel that had done uh, posted very regularly, very consistently for a year, one video a week um, for so about 50 videos by the time they talked with me and they had seven full time people on this channel and they all had Hollywood television production uh, backgrounds. It was a uh, it was a vegan channel, and they met, they were recording in a commercial kitchen with a paid actress um, who was vegan and everything. And I mean, I'm watching this this content prepping for the session, and I'm not vegan, but I'm like, I could eat that. <laughs> like that looks amazing, uh, and the and the cinematography. It all was so. It was just. It was perfect. And so we get in the session, and they're like, "Hey, Tim." Um, and this is almost exactly what they said. We've been we've put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this channel this year. Why does our top video only have 24 views? But there's this kid in his basement with a webcam who gets millions. We're going after that same audience. Why his vi our videos are way higher quality than his. Our tutorials and cooking these things are way better than his. Why is he getting millions? And even though we're making better videos, we can't break 24 views on a video. First of all, what makes a good video or makes better video? That's very subjective, right? Um, yeah. But not really, because we've been kind of poking at it here, which is like, well, like I told these guys, I was like, I watched a lot of your videos and I still don't even know your host's name. Like, oh, well, yeah, we didn't want to put her name onto it on purpose because we want people to connect with the brand and, and the food and, and, and not her because uh, you know, we might change her out later if we need different you know, uh, hosts and things. And I was like, well, that's fine. But like, if I'm watching a lady cook something, I at least should know her name. There's got to be something there to connect to. Like I, we connect with people better than we connect with information. And so the other kid 
in his basement, I not only know his name, but I know his creed. I know his, why he, what he believes about veganism. I know why this matters to him. Um, there's a community of people who share that belief around it. Uh, he's telling stories about it, not just information. And so he can make these how-to tutorial videos on cooking vegan recipes, but people are there because not just for the information, though. They're there for the community, the shared beliefs, and, and the brand that's being built around it. Brand being a, a belief system, not necessarily icons and logos like sometimes we think about it. So um, that's exactly the difference between someone who can do how-to content and track millions and someone who makes arguably a better technical video information wise yeah. and production wise and everything and gets like not nearly the results uh, on their content. But there is an argument to be made. I'd like to hear what you guys think about this where people are like, I'm not trying to connect with people. I just want to make a freaking how to video and leave it at that. Um, and just, you know, is there a place for that still on YouTube? That's an interesting question. I kind of, the first thing that pops into my head, Ingrid, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts too, but uh, the first thing that pops into my head is when you're thinking about like long term for your YouTube channel, what like what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do here? Like if because when I when I think of long term success, I think of how do we get viewers to want to stick around, kind of a thing. And then if we think about how do we get viewers to stick around, that's where we need some connection points, and we need them to know who we are and what what we believe and what why why we're doing what we're doing um for somebody who doesn't want that at all and they maybe just want to make the perfect bite size how to cook a grilled cheese how to fix your doorknob video and there's no connection points SATs. Yeah. yeah how to pass the sats you could probably get a really highly viewed video and maybe it's really useful. You probably won't get many or any people coming back or sticking around. But if that's your maybe barometer of, of success, you don't care about that at all. You just want to make videos that could potentially reach a lot of people. Then you could totally do that. Just making a really bite-sized, great, quick video full of that information that's going to help someone do that you just may not get many people coming back or really garnering some sort of community from that but then you I also run the risk of of blending into all the competition like we said before mm -hmm. yeah right yeah yeah i feel like it's a balance a little bit of personality and the tutorial though in how to content i think that tutorials have their place but it's like very much like Sam said, I'm not going to come back. So you might be crafting it for views, but what does that get you long term? You know, that sense. Well, but I mean, if, it, you, if there's a key viewer signal, though, in our people coming back, though. Usually how to educational content revolves around a creator who's trying to teach someone an expertise that then they are then monetizing or selling it another way, like online course or coaching or events or a book or, you know, something else like that. So, um, I, I agree you, you, in order to turn that viewer into a customer, you need to get them to come back and watch a few more videos and start engaging with your brand. If all you want them to do is click on an affiliate link or something though, that's a, maybe a different story. But then even then, arguably, you could say that they will trust you more because they like you more if you incorporate some of these signals into your content. And then they'll be more likely to trust your your opinion and your voice and buy the thing that you're pitching as an affiliate. So, yeah, I was going to say think, there's even been a handful of like guitar gear and things like that, that I have intentionally thought of the creator that I like, who I remember it was like an affiliate for that sort of a thing. I'm like, I want to go buy from them because I like this person and I want to support them. It's funny too, because I think of like channels like Five Minute Crafts, right? Um, this big, big mega, mega channels that, you know, just create these bite-sized, very concise content, um, highly, highly produced, but <clears throat> you don't know anybody who's there. There's zero connection. It's just the tutorial. If, it, you know, and then... Yeah, that was good for a while, but I'm over that. I actually gravitate more towards the channels that have personality. Um, 
just because there's more than just the tutorial. It gets boring yeah, after a while. You like to connect. Yeah. But what would using story in how to content, what would that look like? What, what does think, it look like to use story inside a tutorial? Yeah, I think there's I a think handful we'll, of ways you could do it. I think um, the first thing that I usually think of, because I feel like that's a really, we get that question all the time with, yeah, I get mm -hmm. storytelling and story structure, but I'm a how-to channel. Like if I'm just going to show you how to do this thing, how, how does that work for me? But I think you can shoot your video pretty much the same way you would have done it in the first place. But if you just slightly change their perspective a little bit and how you're setting the video up um, and it's more of a kind of, instead of it being watch me do this, it's kind of like a do this with me, like come with me as we cook this thing or fix this thing. And we're kind of doing it together. You can still nail all the same points of first you, you know, we're fixing a doorknob today, you know, do the first hole here and do the nail here. And, you know, you can still lean into those same points, but there's, there's already more of a connection there when the viewer is able to kind of come alongside you as you're doing this thing and like experience some sort of transformation that ultimately will or won't happen by the end of the video that you're already connecting more just by re posturing how the video is framed versus just, all right, watch me today. We're going to do this thing. And then you just go through it real quick and then you're done. So I cut you off Ingrid. What, what were you going to say? Oh, you're good. I was just going to say that I feel story 100% belongs in tutorials. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it doesn't have to be some epic big story. Mm -hmm. You know, it can right. just literally be just the tension. You know, what is the problem? What is the frustration? And dipping into that first before revealing the solution. Um, something as simple as that actually moves people. And, you know, we see it all the time in graphs. It moves people forward in the content um, versus them abandoning it. Yeah, just as maybe as simple as saying, I <laughs> want blank, but yes. I can't, or I don't know, or this obstacle. So let's find out, right? And I, so you could just, <clears throat> I've used this example before, but instead of, uh, I've used it again, I guess in this episode too, where instead of making the tutorial video about how to build a a dresser you just say my wife hates this dresser and she wants one that looks like this she's out of town this weekend and i just wanted to see could i build a dresser that looks like this instead before she gets home i don't know but let's find out and then it's the whole tutorial right but now you're watching not just for the t for not just to learn how to build a dresser but you want to see what the wife's reaction is going to be when she comes home so simple just two sentences in the beginning of character who, who's the character i and then desire want and then number three is obstacles. I want this, but, so then you have a but. So the alib is I want blank, but obstacle. So what are you going to try going forward here? Let's see if we, we can do it. That might not for, fit in every single video, but you get the idea that there's pretty fairly simple ways. Um, like uh, this guy, Dan, I did a session with uh, years ago, a drawing tutorial channel. And instead of just saying, here's how you draw a human-like face and blend into the competition. The um, I think he opened it up, the content saying, my wife just says she can't draw faces. Um, and I figure what else. It was something like that. I, I, and, and maybe you feel that way See, too. Here's what she did relatable. first. Yeah. And then after only one thing after one attempt she tried it this way and here's her se so second result so i think if i remember he was showing teasing the transformation of the mm -hmm. of the character in the very beginning of this tutorial of how to draw a face and instead of getting about 10 to twenty thousand views like he normally gets he got last time i looked at it um they went up to like eight hundred thousand views fairly quickly and uh, the title and thumbnail were both it was a tutorial video but it was teasing the transformation of how to draw a human looking a, a face that looks human uh with one simple tweak or something like that so you know, I think that's something right that's also important, too, is you, you just talked about titles and thumbnails, Tim. Um, when you have a tutorial, too, you're starting, you're teasing the problem, right? The frustration a little bit. And what's the value that I'm going to get? Maybe you're even showing the transformation, but you can't reveal that too early in the content either. Because once you give your audience what they have, they're going to go. Well, it depends on what it is. In the drawing example, it's a... 
This was attempt number one. This is attempt mm-hmm. number two in the thumbnail. Oh my gosh. Sure. How did they go from <clears throat> attempt number one? How did attempt number two get so be- so much better? And that's yeah. the intrigue. But yeah, if the intrigue yeah. is all revolving around the result of how do I get there, um, I think, I think yeah, that totally makes sense. But you can make the, in- the, uh, the intrigue revolve around other things too. Like the, how do they do that? Yeah, I think it's important that we just at least admit that information only gets us so far, right? I feel like I'm going to toot my own horn here a little bit, but I think the story makes sense. (laughs) Uh, I was uh, watching a TED Talk last week, and this guy, this physician, was like working in a hospital, and they're trying to address some of the mortality rates that that they're having in the birthing center. And, and so they try doing all these different things. They try putting together better uh, checklists for physicians and nurses to follow. Um, they got them better equipment um, that didn't really have an impact. They started hosting classes that were mandatory for these people to come to. That didn't really make a difference. Um, and then they decided to take a totally different approach. And they instead um, hired and trained 400 coaches birthing coaches. And then they had those coaches work with each of the, phys- the physicians and work with them personally one-on-one. And even though those physicians knew all the information, having the coach there did two things. Number one, it increased the uh, the, mortali- the mortality rate, um, not just of this one place, but of several hundred birthing centers improved by 66% in four months. Whoa. When nothing else was working, was it 66? I'm putting my, hold on, I got it right here in front of me, actually. It was, uh, yeah, 66% in in four months. When, and and the point of this TED Talk was like, people get better at what they do because of coaching, not just because they have access to better information. And, uh, but the second thing that changed there was not just the mortality rate um, shot uh, up and significantly Im- improved, was that it changed the morale among all the people, mm-hmm. the physicians and the nurses who work there and in a really positive, positive way. And so... Um, when we when we talk about making how to videos, I think we it's easy to fall into this trap that it's just about the information. But the information will only get you so far. It's I know we're not necessarily coaching in our in our videos, but in some way we are. And in coaching, there's like a relationship you have with the coach. There's someone here who's you know coaching. Well, also they'll look at what you're doing, kind of like what we do at video creators. That's what I thought might be sound sounded like we're going to toot our own horn. We coach these creators. We we um, you know, watch what they're doing. We look at their data. We look at their analytics. We get in meetings with them. We did review their strategy with them, and we coach them and, and make it better so that their channel grows. Um, but in some ways, content does can do that as well. But a coach isn't just sterile information. A coach is like I'm connecting with someone, someone here. And I think when you start building a community around your content, around your channel, and the how tos and the tutorials and everything, it starts the, the community when as that builds momentum, that means people start feeling something and they start connecting with something and it's no longer just about the information but now it's about oh i feel like you know i'm seen i'm heard and cared for in some way um through the content so i don't know you guys have any ideas on like how does that how do we do that how do we actually pull that off practically speaking yeah i feel like you just said so much good stuff there like Mm -hmm. i I think I it's so it off the TED talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's so easy to lose sight as a creator of the fact that it's you know YouTube is a one one to one experience. You know, it's really easy when you see these view counts and subscriber counts and just like this the masses of people who are on the platform, and you just think of your video as like you know you're standing on a stage with a megaphone shouting out into the sea and hoping people stop by and stick around but like the idea of coaching is so interesting when it comes from from the creator to viewer relationship because it is a one-on one-to-one experience every single view is is a one-to-one view and so uh that may be a good practical first step if if that's a maybe for someone listening and that's kind of a new realization for you that you can speak directly to the person i know a lot of 
creators. It's kind of become like YouTuber lingo, I feel like, to open the video and be like, hey, everybody, hey, everyone, you know, but if you use more like you language, like I'm here to help you do this thing and you're giving them real value and connecting with them in that way, I think that translates across video. I think the viewer watching feels like they're helping me right now in my circumstance and my problem with whatever I'm trying to accomplish right now. So that was the first thing that came to mind. I think that's such an interesting concept of thinking about it from, from a coaching perspective. And I think too, when it comes to approaching it in that kind of like one-to-one mindset, there's almost this like positive feedback loop that happens because if you help somebody in that way and maybe they leave a comment or it's, you know, they've actually made a connection with you and community was kind of a focus in, in, um, your approach to your content and they connected and maybe left a comment and was like, I totally resonated with what you said about X, Y, and Z, you know, whatever you said in your video, it kind of creates this positive feedback loop where now as the creator, you're feeling like I'm actually making a difference in somebody's life. I'm helping them actually tangibly achieve this thing. Now you feel more motivated as a creator to keep going and keep finding more of these one-to-one kind of interactions or more people out there to, to actually help. Um, so I feel like that kind of spurs you on too, just as a creator continuing to make content. Well, and I feel too, you know, that a lot of creators on how to channels, you first start your channel with one goal and one focus, right? And it's really about you and the content, but the more voices that come and enter the picture and start leaving you con comments, you know, um, maybe even send you emails, maybe you do have a product off off of the platform that they take, they like you guys were talking about, they become people, right? It's not just about the information. And you realize that your reach, and the impact and the way that you can actually change lives, all of a sudden kind of sometimes it's not uncommon to see that with creators that it shifts your purpose a little bit yeah. on the channel even and the content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Igor, what are some things that make it easier for people to connect with a creator in a how-to content? Are there any things they can do, signals they can provide that would make the viewer more quickly without like taking five minutes to like time out some YouTube person on some podcast that I had to tell you a story. So here's a quick story. Okay. Back to the content. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just make, you know, make your story just part of the journey, you know? And I think that Really, we talk about primal branding a lot, and I know we've we've even talked about it several times today. Um, you know, just weaving in your story and just your experience, even of that day. Don't don't make your video perfect. Leave in mistakes is a good one because it's relatable and it's human. And if you're just showing me a perfect situation every time, and then I go to do it, chances are I'm probably not going to get it perfect, and that's frustrating. So to see you kind of drop the salt, maybe, (laughs) or the chocolate, if you're doing a cooking thing, um, all of a sudden it humanizes you. I end up laughing and I connect with you and chances are I'm going to probably watch a little bit more. Um, Little things like that. And then also really asking for engagement. You know, don't be afraid to ask somebody, you know, in your content even, especially if you're doing more of a community call to action where we're actually seeking out engagement intentionally, um, asking people, what what are the things that have tripped them up? What are the things that frustrates them about something? Because life is not perfect. And that will spark conversation. And conversation means connection. Yeah. And sharing what you believe and why Mm -hmm. people connect around that. Um, Hey, we're going to work at this together. Like, join me as I, as you were talking about, Sam, that's that's really good. and uh, using other ways to keep people engaged can be really good too, like the community tab or stories and live streams and things like that. So, yeah, um, there was a time when just a straight up tutorial could do really well on YouTube and they still can. But there's a more predictable way if you're if par- if your goal of creating the how to content is a form of community and get people to love what you do and not just um uh, you know, watch what you do and kind of be like, okay, I got the information. See, yeah, but you want them to connect. You want them to come back. You want them to continue to engage with your with your content. Then I think doing some of these things like um, uh, 
storytelling, sharing your beliefs, your creed, things like that will really, really go um, a long way because um, while you might have gotten away with that in the past, YouTube's becoming more and more crowded and there's more and more reasons why we should just uh, make sure that we are, before we are trying to sell someone on something, we just need them to believe in what we do. And one of the ways you get them to believe in what you do is to make it easier for them to connect with you and want to um, buy into what you're doing and what you stand for and what you believe in your story. So connection is still a big part of making tutorial videos and how tutorials work well. Um, information is really, really good and important, but wrapping it around a personality that people connect to you is also just as important. Each week, we like to leave you with a power tip. And this week, YouTube Studio has given us a quick snapshot of some of the most pertinent metrics on one screen, which makes it really digestible. But there's been kind of like an upgrade. We're getting it now per content type, which is amazing. And they've even added a new little card to it. The goal here is to help you more easily compare how your different content formats are performing. So you're going to access this in YouTube Studio. On the left, you'll click Analytics, and then you'll click Content, and then All. Once you have All, you will see all these different cards. You have Views there, Published Content, and Typical Views for the first 28 days. But what's cool about that, it has a breakdown now of Video, Shorts, Lives, all the different types of content that you can actually upload on YouTube. The newly added card, though, also breaks down subscribers gained, which is kind of a nice insight to have at your fingertips to see how many new subscribers you have by shorts versus videos and so on. You can also find on that page how many view, how viewers find you, all the different traffic sources, what the top remixed shorts are, as well as impressions and how they led to your watch time. There's a link in the show notes if you want more information about all the updates rolling out to analytics. So go check it out. And thank you for hanging out with us again for another Video Creators podcast episode. We'll see you again next week. When I think we're talking about surviving the YouTube roller coaster of emotions, the highs, the lows, and the balancing acts and all that good stuff. Look forward to seeing that. Bye. <laughs>